Thank you so much for that nice introduction and thank you so much for inviting me um, here today and good morning um, to those of you on the East Coast like I am. I am going to structure my talk into three parts today. The first part, I'm gonna give an overview of NIH and um, its mission. On the second part, I'm gonna give an overview of the SBIR and STTR program overall at NIH. And the third part, I'm going to delve into the specific mission of the institute I work for, the National Institute of Bioimaging and Bioengineering, um, and the programs, portfolios we support, and other entrepreneurial resources that we have. Um, interest of full disclosure, I have no financial interests. Okay, so let's first part, I'm going to give an overview of NIH. Um, for those of you who don't know, NIH is part of HHS, um, Human Health Services um, in the United States. We are a research institution. We have a large campus in Bethesda, Maryland. We have about 6,000 scientists and laboratories and we do intramural research. Um, part of that research um, helps lead to the Moderna vaccine. Um, what you might not realize is that's 10% of the overall NIH budget. NIH's 85% um, of the budgets goes to support other institutions and people. We call this our extramural research program and we do this through grants. We support greater than 4,000 institutions and greater than 300,000 scientists and research personnel. A small part of this budget is our SBIR budget um, and STTR budget, which goes directly to supporting small businesses. Uh, NIH is composed of 27 institutes and centers. There's about 40 billion in funding annually. And as I said, 1.2 billion, so a small part of that budget um, goes to our commercialization. So this is to support small businesses. This is outreach programs to small businesses. And we do have some entrepreneur training programs. I will talk about some of them later on. Um, here's just a quick org chart that shows an overview of all the institutes and centers. Each institute and center has their own mission. One of the toughest parts about applying for funding at NIH is understanding the mission of each institute and which institute would be best um, for your um, medical device or medical technology that you're trying to get funded. In my talk, I'm going to give an overview at the, um, of the mission of NIBIB. And if you look through the program for um, this non-dilutive funding seminar, there are a lot of other direct institute direct um, SBIR directors from different NIH institutes, and they'll talk and give an overview of the mission for each of those institutes. So um, check out those talks. So just to give you an idea, there are a lot of different government agencies that do give out funding, some in the form of grants, some in the form of contracts to small businesses. Here is just um, comparing three agencies, so the National Science Foundation, NIH, and DARPA, um, in terms of what type of funding they give out, we, we give out. So if you look at the top graph here under the spectrum of support, NIH is in blue. We really support applied research. So it is on the basic research end, but it's not like NSF, which supports basic um, R&D. We really need to see something that's applied and it has to be within our biomedical mission. Um, and then if you look at DARPA, <laughs> they fund the whole spectrum. Um, if you look at the, the probability of success graph, so NIH is not a very high um, risk culture. Um, we support projects that are shown to work. DARPA is one of the high risk funding um, opportunities that are available through the United States government. NSF um, can fund some more. So I just got a chat that says I'm not seeing the share screen. Um, can somebody <laughs> let me know if that's for everyone or just for the one person that chatted me? Okay, somebody else, a lot of other people say we do see the screen, so I'm sorry for the one person um, who can't see it. Um, I hope you can fix that. I know that the slides will be made available later on um, through um, FreeMind. 
Okay, and then finally, in terms of entrepreneurial, if you look at this graph, it, it doesn't look promising for how much entrepreneurial support we fund, but this graph was really made um, for some of our other programs. We fund a lot of university and academic research. Um, and so um, in our SBIR program, which is specific to commercialization, I do think we are very entrepreneurial and we're looking to fund those early stage startup businesses. I wanna just give you the full text of our NIH mission statement. So it's up here for you to read, but really NIH is focused on medical and behavioral research. Uh, the research that we do at NIH really needs to have a biomedical or clinical focus. It needs to have a disease or diagnostic application, and it's what you can consider applied research. Um, if you're familiar with DOD, we don't fund the 6.1 um, basic research mechanisms. We have to be a little more applied than that. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into the overview of the NIH, SBIR, STTR opportunities um, that we offer and all and our funding mechanisms. So this is an overview chart of the different phases of funding that we offer through our SBIR program um, at NIH. So our first phase, we are divided basically into two phases, a phase one and a phase two. Our phase one grants are up to 252K um, and they are for six to 12 months. We have mostly a two phase um, funding mechanism. In phase one, it's generally capped at 252K and it's for six to 12 months. And really what we're hoping at the end of a phase one grant um, is that you can show us proof of feasibility. Will your technology work? Our phase two is up to 1.6 million, it's for two years. And at the end of that, we are really hoping that you can show us um, a prototype of your product or development. Um, the phase two applications do require a commercialization plan. That means, have you reached out to your stakeholders and conducted interviews, and are you designing your technology towards what they are looking for? Stakeholders don't always just mean the end users. Sometimes it can mean the payers and the hospital system. And the FDA is almost definitely a stakeholder um, for most biomedical applications. You do not have to have a completed prototype to reach out to the FDA. In fact, it's better if you reach out to the FDA earlier and they can tell you what the requirements are going to be to get FDA approval for your device or biomedical technology. And you can build your device towards those the FDA specifications. This saves time and money in the long run and helps you get FDA approval faster. We do have a phase 2B award. And IBIB doesn't participate in the phase 2B awards, so I won't discuss it further. Um, some of the other institutes that do can help discuss that more. We do have a fast track process. Um, the fast track process basically is a simultaneous review of phase one and phase two at the same time. So you'd submit both those applications at once. They would be reviewed at once. What I tell people is if you're not ready with your phase two commercialization plan, milestones, research and development, but you are ready with your, your phase one, it's better just to submit the phase one because what will happen with when review goes through it, they will review both together and your phase one um, might not get funded where it could have because your phase two isn't ready yet. However, if you are ready with your phase two, then you can go ahead and submit both at the same time. It's our fast track mechanism. What happens is you'll receive, should you uh, be chosen to receive funding, you'll receive funding for your phase one. At the end of your phase one, you have to submit um, a final report that shows that you've done all of your milestones. It will be reviewed by grants management and by your program officer. Once all of that is approved, then your phase two funding will be released. So there is a gap between funding. It's probably will be about two to three months, depending on how long it takes to get all of your paperwork and approvals through the system. We also have a direct to phase two. This is only for SBIR grants. What this means is if you've already done the work um, and shows that you already have proof of feasibility, you can put in a straight direct to phase two application. It still requires the first the commercialization plan. It requires you to show in your research strategy that you have the feasibility. Um, and not all ICs participate in this direct to phase two, but NIBIB does. So I wanted to make sure that I threw it out there. 
Um, yes, there's a question here. Phase two does require commercialization plan. It is not required that you reach out to the FDA before applying for phase two. It can be part of the phase two process. I just suggest to everybody that you reach out to the FDA um, early and I try to tell people it's never too early to reach out to the FDA. Um, that's something that's not generally well known, but really helps your development faster. But it's not required. The commercialization plan is required. Okay, I'm going to give an overview of the application process and timeline. So what happens is you will submit your application to NIH. Your application will go to our division of receipt and referral. They will assign it to an IC. Um, I will go over later how to get in touch with ICs beforehand to make sure you're a mission fit, but you should do that beforehand. And then when you submit your application, you write a cover letter that states you talk to the program officer, you state their name, and that you're a mission fit for their institute. There's also a form that you fill out um, as part of your application process. And in that form, it asks what your primary institute is. You should um, have already reached out to your program officer and be able to fill out the primary institute that you're applying for because you know you're a mission fit. Um, also in that form, it asks what expertise is needed to review your application. This is a box that's commonly skipped. I try to advise all applicants, don't skip that box. Write out what expertise is needed to review your application because what happens after DDR makes sure your application is complete and assigns it to an IC is that it's sent to the Center for Scientific Review or CSR. CSR assigns your application to a peer review panel. You can track online what peer review panel your application has been assigned to and when your peer review panel is going to meet. By filling out that box I previously told you about, it helps the Center for Scientific Review assign your application to the best possible peer review group um, to review your application. About a month after your peer review group meets, a written summary statement will come out. You can find this written summary statement online um, in ERA Commons and in a few slides, I will go over all the online things you have to sign up for to apply. Um, when that summary statement comes out, that's when you should get in touch with your program officer and they should review, help you review the summary statement. They can help you understand really what the critiques mean and what your score means in terms of funding. And um, when you are, um, if you are, if they think you have a high probability of getting funding that round or not. If you don't get a high enough score or a good enough score from um, peer review, you probably won't be able to be re, um, funded. You can submit um, a amended application and it's called an A1 application and your program officer can help you decide whether that's a good route for you to go. Um, it goes back through the whole process again. Um, after the summary statements come out from peer review, the summary statements and scores get sent back to the ICs. Each IC has their own process for determining which applications will be funded. At NIBIB, we look at the top scoring applications from each round. We look at portfolio balance and mission fit, and then we make our recommendations to our council for funding. For SBIR grants, we don't have a pay line for funding like other institutes have. Um, once we make the recommendations to council, council has to approve all applications for funding. And then finally, the IC director has to approve all applications for funding before funds can be released. So that means from the receipt date of your application till you get funding, if you are successful on your first try, you won't get any funding for six to nine months um, at a minimum. And that's due to this extensive peer review process that we have at NIH for awarding funds. At NIH, for our SBIR grants, we have three standard due dates a year. They're January 5th, September 5th, and April 5th each year. If those dates happen to fall on a federal holiday or weekend, then that date is pushed to the next um, workday. And at the bottom here in red, you can see um, the timeline of when things will happen within each due date. All right, what qualifies as a small business for NIH? Because each agency has its own roles. At NIH, you have to be a for-profit organization. That means you have to be registered as an LLC, a sole proprietor, a C-Corp, something like that, but you have to have a defined business um, registration. You have to have 500 or fewer employees, including affiliated employees, and you have to be a US-owned and operated business. This is the NIH definition of a small business. If you apply to a different U.S. government agency, this might change. 
Required registrations. So all applications for NIH goes through online system. There are several registrations that you have to apply to to use our online application system. And as you can see here, they're different depending on which um, government funding agency you're applying to. NIH is part of HHS. So for us, you need a DUNS number. You need to register in SAMS. You have to have a company registration in SBA.org. You need an ERA Commons account and a Grants.gov account. It can take six to eight weeks to get all of these registrations in place. So please start early um, signing up for all of these systems so that you can make the receipt date that you're trying to make with your application. All of the details on how to register for all of these systems are found in the PAs, um, fully detailed there for you to look at. Okay. Um, at NIH, we do have some differences between applying for an SBIR or an STTR. An STTR is really used when you want to partner with a nonprofit research institute um, for your grant. Most of the times, this is in terms of a university. If you are applying for an STTR, the PI must um, can be primarily employed by the small business or by the partner research institute. If you're doing the SBIR, the PI has to be primarily employed by the small business. And then there are some differences between the percentage of time um, that small businesses can work on the grant versus your university partner. That doesn't mean that you can't have a university partner and apply for an SBIR. You just have to watch what percentage of time um, the university versus your um, academic partner is working on the grant. And you have have to make sure that the PI is primarily employed with the small business. Um, one more quick thing. What I tell people about the difference between SBIR and STTR funds, if you are in a position to choose which one you apply to, we have more funding available for our SBIR mechanisms. We have fewer applications for our STTR mechanisms. So it really all depends on the round that you apply to, whether you should apply for an SBIR or STTR. It's really hard um, to gauge which has a higher probability of funding because it all depends on who applies. But what I tell applicants is you should really pick the mechanism that works best for your research and for the science um, and technology that you want to develop. Okay, we have a lot of funding opportunities that are listed. I will talk about the omnibus ones, which most of our funding announcements come in um, in a little bit. But if you want to look over um, all of the funding opportunities for SBIR, the website is sbir.nih.gov, and then you can go to our funding page. This website, sbir.nih.gov, really gives a full, detailed, complete overview of the SBIR mechanisms um, at NIH, and it's a really good resource for you to follow up after this presentation. Um, they've got a great FAQ page um, that really details everything. All right, and finally, the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about NIBIB specific SBIR program and what our mission is. So at NIBIB, I like to tell people we are the Design and Engineering Institute of NIH. We are different than most other institutes because we are not disease specific. We say we're disease agnostic. This means that you can apply to us with all types of medical devices um, and design and engineering biomedical um, platforms um, for any type of disease. What I tell applica applicants is just because we're disease agnostic, doesn't mean that you should apply and say this device can be used for four or five different kinds of diseases. Um, a lot of times when small businesses are developing a new technology, they know that it has applications in a variety of different diseases. The best applications and the ones that are um, looked at best by peer review have a specific focus. So what I try to tell small businesses is this is a business decision. Understand your market, understand which disease, which focus, which application of your product um, is easiest to adapt, the market is most ready for, um, you think you could make the best business decision for, and then focus your specific aims and your application for that specific purpose. So this is a slide um, that I shamelessly stole from the director of NIBIB and what it is 
is a rearrangement of the org chart of all of um, the NIH institutes. And what it shows is that NIBIB technology is really in the center. So all of our technology feeds into all of the different disease areas and disease programs. Um, and that's why we say that we are disease agnostic. What exactly constitutes a biomedical device? Uh, question I just got. So really it's a technology that saw that um, fills a biomedical gap or need. Um, that's what we're looking for. It can be a device, it can be a platform. We do have some platform-based programs as well. Okay, NIBIB mission. So NIBIB really has three separate divisions that we fund in. The first division is the division I'm a part of, Division of Applied, uh, is, well, Division of Discovery Science and Technology, it's this middle box here. We're really the engineering division. So we are looking at all different types of engineering portfolios. A lot of times we have our um, bionic systems, people developing prosthetic arms, prosthetic pieces, things like that. We have our biophotonic engineering portfolio. Can you turn things off and on using lights? and light, different types of light sources. Really in this portfolio, we're looking for a closed loop system. How can you use biology to turn things on, turn things off, design things, make things work the way you want them to? Uh, we also have a division of applied science and technology. That's our bioimaging division, developing new types of molecular probes and imaging agents portable ultrasound systems, um, new technology for ultrasound systems, new detectors, um, engineering and design of new sensors. All of those are, are in our bioimaging division. And then finally, we have a division of health informatics. So this is artificial intelligence, machine, whoops, machine learning, deep learning, algorithm engineering and development, um, connected health, mobile health technologies, telehealth technologies. We do have a point of care portfolio. So do you have diagnostic systems or monitoring systems that can be done point of care in a cl clinician's office um, or maybe even wearable type systems um, where people can be monitored and diagnosed at their homes? Um, and then image processing, visual perception and display portfolios. How do you know if your technology is a mission fit for NIBIB and falls under our umbrella? The best way to communicate with us is what's called a specific aims page. And NIH has a specific format we like looking for our specific aims. So it's a one page document composed of four paragraphs. The first paragraph should detail in a sentence or two for each of these bullets, what is the biomedical or clinical gap why does current technology not fill this gap? How can your technology fill this gap? And why is your technology innovative? Um, in terms of SBIR and STTR applications, a gap can also be, we can make it faster, we can make it cheaper. Um, business case scenarios also form a gap um, in, this, in this type of environment. Your second paragraph should really be the who, what, why, your long-term goal, your main objective, your rationale for doing this. The third paragraph um, is your aims. So you should have two to three aims per specific aims page or per project. Um, you should have a title for, an, for each aim in bold and then the supporting details of what the aim is. To be a mission fit for NIBIB, your aim should really show how you're focusing on the design and engineering of new technology. And then finally, you can have a small paragraph at the end that shows the expected outcomes and the impact of your technology. What you wanna do is you wanna write up this AIMS page well ahead of the receipt deadline that you're trying to meet. And then for NIBIB, you email the AIMS page to the email that's seen on the bottom of the slide. And we will get back to you. We will evaluate your AIMS page. We will do it internally. Um, we might ask you follow-up questions on it and we'll let you know if you're a mission fit for NIBIB. And if you're not a mission fit for NIBIB, um, we always try to point you in another direction. So where you could possibly be a mission fit and where you'll fit in. This AIMS page is really an important um, communication tool with NIH. It really helps your chances out of um, getting a grant because you've communicated with us ahead of time, ahead of your application. Um, we've helped guided you towards what our mission is, what we're looking for. Um, 
And a lot of times when you talk to the program officers directly, we can help answer any little questions you have on your application and help give you some tips or advice for your application as well. It is really advantageous for you to submit a specific games page and talk with a program officer before you submit your application and well in advance of your application. So if you uh, submit a specific games page a week before the application deadline, it might not be so helpful. A month before, a month and a half before is um, really good to, to aim for and then we can help you out before you're right at that submission deadline. Okay, what are the funding opportunities um, directly that NIBIB supports? So NIH in general is investigator initiated grants. That means most of the time what we're looking to fund is your own ideas as long as they're in our mission. Um, right now I'm showing the omnibus grant solicitations for our SBIR and STTR mechanisms. These are the clinical trial not allowed mechanisms. There are two other mechanisms if you need clinical trials. Um, and IBIB only supports very limited clinical trials. So it might be a first in human, it might be um, a small phase one, um, but I don't um, dwell on um on those because we don't fund very many clinical trials. And for all of these applications, they both have a phase one, phase two mechanism, and then of course um, the fast track and then the phase two that we talked about. Um, you can click on these links when you download these slides later and get directly to the PA and the PA details, all of the specific parts of the application, um, all of the forms um, that you need to fill out and how to register for all those systems that I spoke about. Please make sure that you read the PA in detail. Please stick to all the font sizes, the page limits, the page numbers. Um, please remember that NIH does not allow hyperlinks in applications. Your application could be disqualified if you have hyperlinks in them. Um, and that's one thing that DDR screens for when you first submit your application to make sure that you are um, in, have a complete application and it meets all the requirements for an NIH application. We do have a nosy out currently at NIBIB. This is a notice of special interest. So this is technologies that we are particularly interested in funding um, and looking into. Right now, this nosy consists of some specific modeling and simulation technologies, um, some pediatric technologies or specific engineering design of technologies for pediatric patients, looking for some point of care ultrasound technologies and clinical decision support technologies. Um, NOSIs are just a, hey, we're really interested in this kind of announcement to the community. Um, but like I said, the Omnibus is investigator initiated um, applications. And then finally, um, I did mention that um, we do provide some sort of a lot of entrepreneur training programs for entrepreneurs that are in our program. I'm just going to talk to you about one today. And this is our Concept to Clinic Commercializing Innovation C3I program that we run out of NIBIB. You do have to be a funded NIBIB investigator to apply for this program, but once you get a grant from us, you can apply. This program is really designed to uh, teach biomedical innovators and biomedical device innovators specifically how to translate the technology that they developed on the bench and get it into the market. It's tailored specifically for each company. So if you're accepted into the program, you get a business advisor just for your company and or a project manager just for your company. They help you look at your technology, access your technology, and really figure out a niche where your technology could meet. A lot of times um, that's through um, hooking you up to their network, um, encouraging you and teaching you really how to do good interviews. A lot of our companies come in and they think they have a good um, market for their technology and they change their whole focus through this program because they found that there's a better market, a better niche, a different type of need for the technology they have. But it's really a tailorized um, customized curriculum. It is a three-part component. Um, the first part is our C3I education program. This one's really aimed just at academic investors, 
investigators. It is um, an all virtual program. It was designed to be all virtual before COVID. It's about 10 to 12 weeks. And it really starts teaching academic investigators what they need to think about to get their devices through the FDA, to find that niche, um, really starts helping develop pitch talks um, for follow-on funding, um, things like that. Our main C3I program is 24 weeks. It's a validation and execution program. It's for academic investigators or small business investigators that are funded um, by NIBIB. Uh, we used to have an in-person boot camp at the beginning and an in-person boot camp at the end. Of course, those have all been changed to virtual due to COVID. Hopefully, they'll be in person again soon. Um, the first part of the program is all validation. Um, so really um, how to do the networking, how to do the informational interviews, how to find your niche, how to um, talk with the FDA. Um, sometimes people don't have a licensed company yet, how to license your company. And then the second part is, is the execution part. So um, talking to um, BC or angel funding, applying for SBIR grants, um, and a whole slew of other things included in those programs. And finally, we have our C3I experience Excel program. You have to be a graduate of the C3I program to apply for it. It is a supplemental funding, so it gives you some funding to do the killer experiment or the killer um, the killer project that you need to get done to prove to venture capitalists um, that your technology is worth funding, um, walks you through writing an SBIR grant if needed, um, and a lot of other tailored mentoring programs for that. You can look at the website down here. It goes into more detail about these programs, um, how to apply, and then the program um, dates that they're going to run for the year. And then finally, there are a lot of ways to stay connected to us and find out about our opportunities. I have listed them, just a few of them on the slides here. Um, but as you keep clicking around, you'll find a lot more ways to get in touch. And I am Dr. Alana Goldberg. You can reach me at all of the contact information below. And I am happy to answer any further questions um, if they are here in the chat. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate you listening. So um, we have a question here about feasibility for phase two. So there's no set requirements for fee for for feasibility. Um, what you have to make sure that you show is any data, um, any testing. Um, any information that you have that shows feasibility, but we don't have a set, hey, it has to do X, Y, and Z. This is up to your discretion. Um, there are online um, some sample applications um, that help, help with this part, um, but no set requirements. Okay. Okay, so here's somebody that is a small company. They have a phase one, a phase two grant with an established hospital. Um, small one person companies qualify. Um, there's no, you know, there's a limit on the maximum size of a company, but there's no limit on um, how small a company can be as long as you are a registered LLC, I Corps, um, C Corps, sole proprietor. Um, it's not, you know, that's what's required, that you're a U.S.-based company, that you're a registered company, and that you're, you're lower, you're smaller than 500 people or affiliates. Um, so yes, a one, a small one-person company qualifies just fine, as long as you can show that you have the network um, and the resources to, to get the project done. So there is a, a page where you show what facilities you have, um, what your collaborators are and what facilities they have. We just want to make sure that you have the resources you need to get it done. Um, apply for another phase one grant. So that is very specific to your company um, and your needs. Generally, people go from a successful phase one directly um, to a phase two because they need the extra funding and there's not enough funding in a phase one to continue the project. Um, but reach out to me um, specifically and we can discuss your, your specific situation and go from there. 
Um, another question, are you handling digital therapeutics since you handle digital health HCIT or are DTX handled by therapeutic areas they apply to? Um, so good question. That depends on where you are in the development. If you are in the early stage engineering design of digital therapeutics, that's NIBIB. If you are in the, hey, we just need funding to really test these and optimize our digital therapeutics, that is the um, IC that is the specific disease area. The best way to determine that is to write up a specific games page and send it to me. Um, if I can figure it out from your specific games page, I'll let you know. If not, we can have a further on conversation um, and really help me to understand where you are. And then I can point you in the right directions. Are there restrictions on experiment outsourcing? Um, so I th you need to be a little more specific than that. What I can say to you is that you are allowed to have um, subcontractors um, and collaborators on your projects. Um, but really, if you look at the STTR and SBIR requirements, there's at least like 30% or 40%, depending on which one you're looking at, of the work that has to be performed um, by the small business itself. So those, those are the requirements that I would look at. Okay, we have a product that was approved for use in a certain indication. We are seeking to develop it for another. Would that be eligible for the grant program? Yes, absolutely. Um, but which IC you go to depends. Do you need to re-engineer or redesign your product for this new disease indication? If so, that's NIBIB. Um, if you just need funding to test it for this new disease indication, that might be, or optimize it for this new disease indication, that might be the Disease Specific Institute. Um, I know I'm, I sound like I'm a, a record uh, stuck on repeat, but the best way to assess this is to write up a specific games page, send it to to me and I will look into it um, and, and help you really determine. That's, that's what we're here for and that's the, the power of the specific games page. Okay, um, can a company in the US with PI and overseas country apply? So I'm going to say technically Yes, as long as it's a U.S.-based company. However, for any foreign um, contacts or usage for SBIR grants, you have to write up a foreign justification and you have to justify why you have to use somebody um, that's in a foreign country and why there are no expertise available in the U.S. Um, and then that is just up to the grants committee, whether they accept your justification or not. Um, NIH SBIR program is really focused on funding US-based companies. There are some other um, SBIR programs through the US government um, that is more open to international companies. Um, the DOD comes to mind, BARDA comes to mind as being more open. For clinical trials, does NIBIB require IND IDE at the time of submission or only at the time of award? So the answer to that is only at the time of award. We just, um, well, you don't even need it at the time of award. What you need is your IRB at the time of award um, to be approved. And what we do is we put, um, we put a hold on your funding and say you can't use your funding until your IRB approval is through um, to perform these projects. But as I mentioned, um, NIBIB only funds really phase one clinical trials and first in human clinical trials. We do not have the funding to fund the phase two, the phase three, the big large clinical trials. Those are really done through the disease specific institutes. Okay, <laughs> that's the end of the question list I have. If I didn't answer your question, it means I missed it. So please re-enter it into the chat. Or if you have another question, um, please enter it into the chat now. Um, if questions come up in the future, my contact information is up there. Don't hesitate to get in touch with me and I will help you out as best I can. Thank you everyone. Mm -hmm.